Good morning. It is late April and, uh, you know, the temperatures haven't risen all that much here in Nova Scotia yet. Uh, it's still getting down to right around the freezing mark in the evening. Now it's going up to, well, plus 10 to plus 12 degrees Celsius, that is, in the days, the nice days. Uh, lots of sunshine, very little cloud today, and no wind, which is great. Uh, the one thing I'm noticing, or not noticing yet, and maybe that's, well, it is because of the cooler temperatures, is that there's no bugs, no biting flies. Nothing that I have to put anything on to uh, keep from biting me. That's the joy of it. Temperatures may be a little cool, but they do keep the bugs at a minimum. All except one. There is one bug out here right now that's looking for you, and if it finds you, it can cause you a lot of grief. We all know what that is. Those are ticks. So that will be the topic of today's coffee chat is about ticks. So uh, if you're interested, keep watching. Question of the day. I want you to identify this tree. I'll give you some hints as we get a little closer. So it is a conifer tree. You can see some of the new cones appearing there but it loses its needles during the winter. What tree is this? Second question of the day. I couldn't pass this up because, well, it may not be here the next time I come through because it's quite ephemeral. What is this flower and what is the significance of it to us here in Nova Scotia? Okay, I'm about to make myself some coffee, but before I do, I thought it's about time I get caught up on those question of the day answers that people have given me. So I just wrote them down. I just want to make sure that I get them correctly. So I think it was two videos ago where I had shown you some lungwort on a tree and I had asked what is uh, lungwort and the significance of it and that type of thing. Well, it's interesting. I actually got two comments, both of which is correct, but the first comment was came from Ed Arshad and Ed identified it as pulmonaria, which is the Latin name for lungwort. And he said, because it looks like lungs. Okay, that's true. That was only part of the answer that I was looking for though, Ed, so I appreciate that you were right and you were the first to come up with that, but it was actually Jacqueline, another one of my viewers, who gave me the full comment. So here's what's of interest about lungwort. Um, in a very old document, a couple hundred years old, known as the Doctrine of Signatures, the Doctrine of Signatures says that if a plant looks like a certain body part, then it can be used medicinally to treat issues with that body part. You see where this is going? lungwort. It was believed that you could use lungwort, presumably by smoking it, to treat issues of the lung. And of course, uh, that's not something I would recommend to anybody, but it was Jacqueline who was actually closed the circle on that one. So I appreciate everyone who made comments on that, and the, that's the story behind lungwort. For me, it's a better, what I like about it, of course, is that it's a good indicator of forest health in terms of the lack of pollution. The more lungwort, the less pollution. That's basically what I learned about it. Okay, now the next one was in, I think, the last video that I put out where I showed a tree that had been just all clawed to pieces. It was just hanging in shreds. It was a dead oak tree and as up as high as about 15 feet, you could see holes and the tree was all dug into. And I had some great comments on that. So I had elk, I had bear, I had moose, I had deer. Uh, I even had the, the what was it? The, um, the moose beaver. All right. Yeah, we have some of those in Nova Scotia, right? Big moose beaver. But it was none of those things at all. It was actually a woodpecker. And it was Steve Ripley, also here from Nova Scotia. Actually, Steve has a YouTube channel. Steve lives in the Spring, Air, Spring Hill area of Nova Scotia. And he has a YouTube channel. We chat quite a bit back and forth. In fact, I'm going to put a link to Steve's channel uh, probably on the screen and in the video description, maybe at the end of this video as well, if you're interested in checking out Steve's channel. And Steve identified it as a woodpecker. And you were right on, Steve. 
How did I know it was a woodpecker? I actually saw them doing the damage. It was a pair of pileated woodpeckers, the big ones that stand about 12 to 14 inches high. And I could hear them going to it at the tree and I thought I'd sneak up on them and see if I could capture them in the act. No, I couldn't do that. They were pretty wary, but at least I saw the damage that them actually doing the damage. So that's what caused damage to the tree. All right, I think it's time for coffee. All right, time to make the coffee so that we can sit down and have, an, or have our discussion. So you're not going to believe this. Well, maybe you will. You will if you live in Nova Scotia. We're already under a fire ban here, at least until 7 o'clock this evening. I'm not allowed to have a wood fire. So I brought out one of my stoves. This is a stove I'm testing, a little butane one from Fire Maple. Let's get it lit. It's going to be a bit noisy, maybe, but... Uh, Hopefully you can hear me over this while I prepare my coffee. So here's something I haven't used for a while. You would have seen it in another, another video if you've watched. This is the Wakeko Pipamoka. It is a coffee maker, and uh, rather than talk too much about it, if you are interested, you can go back and have a look at that video. And, uh, you know, it's a good, it's just a bit heavy. It's the only reason I don't take it out with me all the time. This is a capsule that you fill with coffee. That's just a little funnel that you put on top. And Rampage Coffee, of course. This, oh yeah, I didn't think my scoop was in there, but it is. Actually, I don't even think I need the funnel. You can only get so much coffee. You can only make so much coffee. The, the cup itself is only so big. So a little bit more than that, maybe. There, that's it. So two, not quite two and a half scoops is what I was able to get into this. But the nice thing is, as I can vary the amount of time it's in contact with the water. All right, I just have to wait for my water to come to a boil. I'll put it in there, drop this capsule of coffee inside, and then we'll start the process of making the coffee. I'll bring you back at that point. Water is boiling. Let me turn that off. So at least now I can hear. Oh yeah, that locks the lid on. I forgot about that. Now I can get it out of the way. So I'm going to put the water in first. There are lines to which you fill the water up, depending on how much coffee you want to make. And of course, I'm going to make a fairly full cup of water, or coffee that is. So that is the line there. Save that water for doing my dishes. This is the capsule of coffee. It gets dropped in. And you just let it sink to the bottom. And now that's what that's doing as it sinks. Of course, it's pushing air out of the capsule. I can see the bubbles. I wonder if I can show you the bubbles. Probably not. And as it does, it's starting to soak the coffee inside. And I can leave that in there for as long as I want to have contact time. But there's going to be quite a bit of contact in a minute, as you'll see. I think what I'll do is I'll let that sink, let it sit for a minute, and then I'll show you how it's used to uh, make the coffee. All right, I'm going to start the process of making coffee. I'm not going to watch you, let you make you watch the whole process, but here's the lid that goes on top. But here's what basically happens with this device is now that the coffee capsule has sunk to the bottom of the cup, I start turning this collar and I'll just start it so you can see. And what's happening is this is rising out of the cup. And as it does, it's pulling, it creates a vacuum in the bottom. It's pulling all that hot water down through the coffee. So if I just take my, it takes a bit of time anyway, but if I take my time doing that, then it's just that much longer extraction. I think a couple things, I'm just gonna lay the lid on top. That prevents me from spilling it on myself and keeps it a little warm. See how that's working? If you find that at all interesting, there is a link in my Coffee in the Woods, not the coffee chat, or co uh, hike in a coffee series, but a Coffee in the Woods series to my review of this device. Super simple, and it makes a nice cup of coffee. All right. When I finish this up, I'm going to reposition so we can start our chat. All right, before we start the chat, let's check the coffee out. It's got an air seal on it. actually spit a little bit at me. I'll tell you, this Wakeko mug, stainless steel double wall mug. Can you see the steam? It's keeping things smoking hot. But it's good. Of course, it's Rampage. How can it not be good, right? 
well, at least the good news is it's going to remain hot throughout our discussion. I don't have to worry about going cold on me while we talk. Just find a place where it's not going to tip over. There. Okay, so I don't know. It's a beautiful sunny day, but it's a lot windier than the forecast said, and it never got to the temperatures the forecast said, which has its benefits. Uh, there are no mosquitoes, there are no black flies, and there are no deer flies. But there are ticks, and I can tell you that from personal experience, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So where did the motivation for do this uh, video come from? Well, just a week ago, before I came out for this video, uh, I got a comment on another video from one of my viewers, Michael Levy, and Michael had suggested, why don't you talk about ticks and tick safety? And I said, great timing, Michael. I was planning to do that anyway. And the reason I was planning to do that is I was out a week ago, and I had a tick attached to me when I got home. And of course, when you have, that's not my first time, it's been a couple of times now that I've had ticks attached to me. I was just surprised. I was within six or seven hours, the tick crawled up my pant leg and it dug itself in deep. And it took quite a bit of work to get it up. And let me just say something about that right now. Um, I wear the snug or the elasticized boxer briefs. I like them because they're comfortable. But I always had this, well, now I know, false impression that they would provide me some protection from ticks crawling up inside underneath. They don't. The tick was well up inside where my shorts were, and I wasn't aware of it until I was getting changed. So I just point that out there is, there is a lot of, well, we're going to talk about some of the myths, and some of the realities, and some of the responses you can have for ticks if you have find one, or just to protect yourself from getting one. In fact, what I will do is we're going to approach this from a risk management point of view. I think it was last video, video before, I can't remember which one it was now, we talked about safety in the woods and I said at least there is one process from my personal background, my professional background, that I'm aware of that you can apply to this so that you neither, neither overreact nor underreact to a situation and that is it's a risk management assessment. So we're going to do exactly that. We're going to do assess the risk, we're going to talk about prevention and mitigation. We're going to talk about response, and then we're going to talk about recovery. So, prevent or assessing the risk. What is the risk of of a tick bite, and what's the the harm, potential harm it has to do with it? Well, okay. So I can only speak for Nova Scotia, and the stats that I was able to dig up for here. You'll have to do your own research into the stats for your local area. But the big risk, of course, that we're all afraid of, or not afraid of, I shouldn't say, but aware of, is Lyme disease. And it, it can be devastating, if, especially if it's not dealt with quickly if you contract Lyme disease. But what is the risk? How serious a risk it is? Lyme disease is the most prevalent tick-borne disease, but there are others. Uh, there's a whole range of them. Just look up tick-borne tick diseases, and there's a lot of them. Lyme just happens to be at the top of the list. It's the one we seem to be most concerned with, as well we should. But just how big a risk is it? Well, I did some research, and in Nova Scotia, according to Nova Scotia Health, 40% of the black-legged ticks, or the deer ticks, another name for the same, uh, same creature, carry Lyme disease. So not even half. More than the third, but not quite a half of all the ticks carry Lyme. That's still quite a high number. And here's the thing. There is more ticks now than there ever was before. And there's a lot of speculation why that is. The most reasonable one is the fact that uh, global or climate change, our winters are warmer. They're nowhere near what they were when I was a young fella. And it just seems to be a warmer winter, uh, long, shorter winters as well. The snow doesn't come until late and it doesn't stay as long as it used to. And not a great spring, mind you. But the winters are not as cold as they used to be. And it used to, the, we would count on those cold winters to kill off ticks, at least a number of them. We're finding now that ticks can be active in midwinter if the temperatures are right for them. And unfortunately, often they are. As a result, every spring, there's a greater amount of ticks hatching and coming out than there was the year before. So the risk increases. Right across Nova Scotia, it's considered endemic, meaning there are ticks everywhere and up to 40% of them are carrying the Lyme disease. And that's not even talking about the other diseases they may be carrying. And that is specifically the black-legged tick or the deer tick. There are other ticks and other ticks can carry other diseases as well. So I just want to put out what that is, the status is in terms of risk. But there's a few things you need to know about that risk. And first off, number one is a tick, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure I believed this until I did the research, a tick must be attached to your body 
for greater than 24 hours before it's able to transmit the disease, if it's a carrier of that disease. I always believe that once a tick broke skin, it could transmit the disease. Now, there is a risk that it can, but I'll get to that in a minute. But by and large, a tick must be attached to your body for greater than 24 hours. In the past, I actually missed a tick because of where it was located on my body, and it was 36 hours later and I uh, discovered it and I removed it. I'm gonna show you, talk about removing ticks in a minute. This one, I discovered it within, well, it had to be within five to 10 hours of it attaching myself because it was when I got home from just one day out in the woods. So it couldn't have been any longer than that. So the risk was greatly reduced. Having said that, there are still things to be aware of and we'll get there in a minute. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is before we move on to prevention and mitigation, is talk about the myths that are out there. And I've heard all of these, and maybe you've heard some of these as well, and maybe you actually believe some of these are true. But here are some of the myths that are out there. And I say the, I want to clear the air on these things because you need to have factual information. First off, ticks are spiders technically. They're arachnids, so they are spiders. They have eight legs. I hate spiders, by the way but they do not spin webs. They don't have spinner wet, spinner at, so they can't spin webs. What I'm saying is, is they can't hang from trees waiting for you to come by, hang by a thread like a spider web. So that's number one. So don't worry about that. They can't do that. They cannot fly. I've heard that one, that ticks can fly at one stage in their life. No, they cannot fly. They cannot jump, and that's another myth that's very common out there. They can't jump either. In order for a tick to be on you, you have to brush by it in the woods somewhere, or in the grass, for that matter, around your home, depending if the ticks are prevalent. It will crawl onto you if, as long as it comes in contact with you. And the way they do that is they take four of their legs and they reach off, and the other four is they hold onto the plant. And as you brush by, they grab on and away you go, and they're off to the races. They climb up and they're looking for those areas where it is dark, moist, and warm. You know what I'm saying, right? So. Uh, and that's exactly where I found the one on me the other day it was in an area that uh, you could easily miss if you don't do a good tick check. So I just bring that back in. Okay, let's talk about prevention and mitigation. Took a second there to grab my coffee, have another drink. I'm going to have to leave the cover off this. That's just as hot as it was a minute when I tried it a minute ago. Oh, man. All right, let's put that down. All right, I got my notes out just so I have some good information to give you on this. Prevention and mitigation. So that's where you want to start. You don't want to um, have to respond to a tick that's attached to your body. You want to prevent them from getting on you in the first place. And there are a number of strategies, the combination of which will greatly improve your chances of preventing it from happening. Mitigation is all about what happens if it does get on you, what can you do before it becomes attached to you. All right, so number one. Bug repellents. Really, you know, if this had been a warmer day and the black flies or the mosquitoes had been out, I probably would have put a bug repellent on my skin. Well, the DEET, which is obviously the one that most people use, will repel ticks just as well as any of the other insects, which is good. Okay, not deer flies, but that's another story. It will repel ticks and uh, keep you safe. And don't be afraid to use uh, your bug repellent all over you. Now, DEET is not the only one, and actually, it's not, a lot of people are turning away from DEET and, and I don't use it as much anymore on my skin for a couple of reasons. One, DEET does soak into your skin. So a lot of people are worried about the health concerns around DEET materials. Also for somebody who works with cameras or any synthetic materials at all, the DEET or the carrier the DEET is in will eat away at the plastics, the nylon, the polyesters or whatever else it is. So I try not to use DEET unless I really, it's so bad that I have to have something on my skin. But there is an alternative that you can put it on your skin. It's a, a, a non-DEET product, and in and I can't remember which one it is. In the US, it goes by Icaridin, Icaridin, and in the Canada, it goes by Picaridin or Picaridin, or it's reversed, one or the other. It's the same drug. So if you go to your drugstore, you'll see DEET products and you'll see non-DEET products. Likely, it has Icaridin or Picaridin in it. It works, it really does. Not as well as they would like you to think it does, and uh, you do have to reapply it every so often. Actually, that's true of DEET as well. Quite often you have to reapply it, if you're, especially if you're active and you're sweating and you're wearing it off. So those are the two products you can put on your skin. We have a unique product here in Nova Scotia called Atlantic. Atlantic. 
All right, pun play on words there. It was developed by a local entrepreneur and it is all natural ingredients and is supposed to be a repellent for ticks. And my understanding is it does work. As I just don't like it. It's, it's not the smell or anything like that. I actually find that it's, when I sweat, it burns. I don't know, maybe I'm just sensitive, right? Okay, so there are some uh, materials, some bug sprays that you can put on yourself to prevent the ticks from getting on your skin. But that's only if you apply them in areas where the ticks are likely to land. Like most of us put it on our hands, our face, the back of our neck, maybe on our arms if they're exposed. We don't think about putting it on our legs, especially if we're wearing long pants. There is another material which is even more effective, but you don't put it on your skin, you put it on your clothes, permethrin. And now, uh, I'm speaking to the Canadians as well as the Americans and anybody else worldwide watching this. In Canada, you cannot buy permethrin for the purpose of putting on your clothes like a bug repellent, like you can in the US. The Sawyer is probably the brand most commonly known to most people in the US. I went to visit my daughter last fall. Guess what I did? I brought home some permethrin and I didn't have a problem getting it into the country. So I was able to get permethrin into the country and I now have it all over my clothes. And that is the single best thing you can do. You can put it on your clothes, ground sheets, tents, anything where you want the protection because the ticks and a lot of other insects for that matter won't cross over the permethrin. You just can't put it on your skin. But before I got the stuff from the US, I did a little research because I wanted to know if you could buy it here in Canada. And even this week, um, on the uh, suggestion that somebody gave me, I found a new source for it. No, you can't buy Sawyer permethrin in Canada. The, and it's 0.5%. That's, that's critical because that's what's recommended by the Center for Disease Control is that 0.5% permethrin is the best that you can have on your clothing. You can buy clothing in Canada that's been treated with it, but how long is it going to last, right? It only lasts so long and you want to retreat your clothing. So if I can't buy the 0.5% permethrin like Sawyer, what can I buy? Well, I did find online on Amazon a material that's designed for spraying around homes, wherever, uh, bedding, I guess, it, that for bed bugs and other insects and mites and things like that. And it comes in at a 0.35% permethrin. That's not bad, you know, I would use that and I'd feel quite comfortable using that, especially if I put the other strategies to use. So that's available on Amazon. I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the brand name of it is, but you know, I'll put a link to where I purchased mine in the video description if you're interested. If Whether you can get it where you are in the world, that's something you'll have to learn for yourself. But then a friend of mine recently made a suggestion that um, farm supply houses, often carry permethrin used for putting on horses and cattle. Ultra Shield, I think it is. So I looked and that is readily available in the farm supply places in this province and in on Amazon and it is 0.5% permethrin. So while it's not intended for you to put on your clothes for human, you know, be around humans, it is intended to be put on other animals and it's the same stuff, exactly. So I would recommend, well, if you're interested in buying it here in Canada and you can't get the Sawyer like I was able to do in the States, then this may be an alternative for you. Permethrin is a great material to use. It is the simple, the best thing that you can use for preventing bugs of any kind from getting on you. And I, I soaked my pants in it from the knees down and my shirts. And when the summertime, when this jacket comes off, it's going to be, you know, everything is going to be soaked, including my hat. It does nothing to the material, so I, I know it's safe for doing that with. All right, a few more strategies for prevention and mitigation, and then we'll go on to response. What do you do if you find a tick on you? So some of the, the more common sense were are wear long pants and long sleeve shirts. That should make some common sense. In fact, I do regardless because it's just bushwhacking. I was coming home with too many scratches on me. So I wear long sleeves and long pants regardless. If you're wearing long pants, you may as well tuck them in your socks. That prevents the ticks from getting up under. I didn't do that last week and that's how the tick got up my pant leg. So um, that's a good strategy as well. But it's also recommended that you wear light colors. It's not that they repel the ticks. It's just that it makes it easier for you to see them and get them off you before they get inside. Um, yeah, summertime I can see doing that. Um, 
well, of course, in the wintertime, the, the risk is reduced, not eliminated, but is reduced by the coal. So that's just another strategy that you can use. Um, I want to say this, though, because I read up on this somewhere as a remedy or a solution in terms of response. If you do find a tick on you, and I just want to clear the air on this, and this is a, or this is a statement from the Center of Disease Controls in Health Canada, there are things you don't want to do. And one is putting Vaseline or petroleum jelly or nail polish or any kind of sealant on top of the tick with the mistaken belief that it will smother the tick and force it to back over to your skin. Maybe, but not soon enough. And if it starts to die, it will likely eject its stomach contents. Exactly what you don't want it to do, right? Okay, and the other thing is, I've heard this one before as well, is you light a match, like a, a safety match or whatever, blow it out and put the hot match on the tick and the tick will react to that. Same deal. All you're likely to do is burn yourself and the tick remains in your skin. Or worst case scenario, it ejects its stomach contents and if it had been carrying Lyme, it's now in your system. So those things are no goes. Don't do those at all. So what can you do if you find a tick attached to you? All right, well, that's what we'll talk about next. Uh, uh, one of life's little pleasures to sit in the woods and enjoy a cup of coffee. Okay, response. Um, maybe only because of my personal experience, I'll be able to say this. If you find a tick on you, and this is the first time because you haven't found one on you before, first thing I'm gonna say is don't panic. And I say that for a reason. Uh, the first tick I found embedded on me I was just annoyed. I was annoyed with myself for having missed it, for allowing it to happen because I didn't prevent it from happening. I didn't do the required tick check. Don't forget that. Do your tick check every time you have a chance. Now, I'm not just talking about when you get home. Uh, if you're out in the woods for a couple of days, you want to be checking once or twice a day anyway for ticks. You want to make sure that if they become embedded, you don't leave them there for any longer than you have to before removing them. But the reason I said don't panic if you find a tick embedded is because sometimes when you panic and find that tick, you worry that it's going to give you Lyme disease, you are rash in your judgment and you yank on it and pull it out and you pull the head off of the tick and it's, it remains in your skin. And if that's the case, it's going to regurgitate and if it was carrying Lyme, it's going into your body. So don't panic. It, you have time to make, it, make sure that you can get it out safely, intact, all in one piece without it transmitting anything to you. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. Now, once you have identified that you have a tick and it's buried in the skin, and you'll know because, well, all right, you'll, there are lots of pictures of what ticks look like embedded in the skin. You need to be able to remove it from your skin. And there are devices that you can use for doing that. I, rec I'm gonna, I brought a few with me. I'll grab them in a second. I'll show you what my personal favorite is, but I'll show you a couple others that I have in my collection. And uh, then we'll talk about what to do with the tick once you have it removed from your system or from your skin. All right, give me a minute to grab those items. All right, I, I retrieved my little collection of tick removal devices, and I'll just go through them. And I'll, the last one I'll show you is my personal favorite and the one I recommend that you purchase. So. Um, you know, the, the, what's recommended most often is a set of tweezers, and I absolutely agree. There are other ones, I'll show you a couple of which, which are designed and intended to be used for tick removal, but they have their pros and cons in my mind. So this is a fine tip point of tweezers. This is what I carry in my first aid kit. This is not the ones I would choose to remove ticks with because I have something a little bit better, but if I didn't have the other ones, this is what I would choose. Can you see how fine the point is on those? These are ideal for removing splinters, which is the reason I carry them in my first aid kit. So that's one item. Here's something that seems to be fairly common, and I I kind of question whether or not it is a, a, a good choice or not. They call it the tick key. Now, if anybody out there has used one of these and was, had been able to remove ticks with it, then I'd be interested in knowing. I have, I'm just a, not, I wouldn't say nervous, I'm a little skeptical that it's gonna be effective. If, if you look closely at it, the keyhole, uh, the round hole comes to a very, very fine V. Am I is that showing up correctly? Maybe a better light over here. And the idea is that you would place the wider hole over top of the tick in, in reverse, and that's important, I'll, show, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. So you're, you're actually pulling the tick in the direction opposite it was facing inward. So you want to take it like it's coming back out. You place it over and you just start moving the tick key backwards across your skin 
until the tick finally releases. And that's a key component of tick removal is you're waiting for the tick to let itself go from your skin. You're not actually pulling it out. You're, you're actually act causing the tick to let go. And that's important. I'll, I'll speak to that again in a moment. Now, so I don't know that this won't work. It's just that I can think of awkward places where it would be hard to use something like this. Uh, but of the two, two I'm going to show you right now, this would be my preference of the two. And the other one, this is in a little a sealed container. And this is called the Tick Twister. Kind of looks like a claw hammer, doesn't it? Or a pry tool of some type. And I think it could be used like that. It's not the way that they're recommended. What they're recommending is, again, can you see the little V-notch on the end of it? The idea is that you come in from behind the tick and then you turn it and twist it. Uh, I, I honestly, I can't re recommend that. But what I could see doing is coming in behind it and then pulling it backwards on a straight uh, air, uh, space. Now, here's the thing. I think this was, well, I'm trying to see if there's anything in the literature. There's, the literature is very, there's, actually, there's nothing right there. Talk about its application, what it's intended for. But I'm pretty sure this is intended for dogs and cats because this one you can get in easier inside of their fur to where the tick is and then use it to remove. So I would, if you have one of these, I'd reserve, reserve it for using on your pets. But if you don't have one of these, don't bother. There's something much, much more effective, much better for use. And that's what I'm about to show you. So I actually have two pair of these. I found them on Amazon. Uh, the ones I purchased, I purchased at a local sporting goods store known as Mountain Equipment Co-op. And this is, the, the to me, the very, very best tool for removing ticks. I've done it a few times now, so I, I can say that with, with experience. Can you see the point on this? See how they're curved around the corner? Very, very fine. And what you can do with that is you can get in behind the tick, grab it on either side, so right at the base where your skin is, where its neck is, and then you start pulling backwards away from yourself in the direction opposite that it is facing in. So you just do that. Now, um, when I did this the other day, it was kind of amusing. My wife, my wife couldn't believe it. it the, the tick was on the inside of my thigh, quite high up, as I mentioned, and I grabbed a hold of it, and once I did, there was no way I was gonna let go of it. So I started to pull backwards away, well, I guess the way its butt was facing, let's say it that way. So I pulled it, was pulling it away. It did not want to release it. The, you know, my skin was tenting and pulling away from my body a little bit. And I just kept the pressure uh, steady up. And within about a minute, the tick said, I've had enough and it let go. All right, so now I have the tick on the end of the tweezers. What am I going to do with this little bugger? I know what most people will do. They'll stomp it or squish it or whatever they'll do. I'm going to recommend you do something different. At least here in Nova Scotia, here's what I would say. And here, take that tick put it in some kind of a sealable container, like a Ziploc bag or a little pill bottle or anything like that, put it inside and keep it alive. And that's important. Well, it doesn't have to be alive so much, but it does have to be not squished. We'll put it that way. Because what you can do with that tick is now you can take that tick to a local drugstore. This is Nova Scotia only. Confirm this for your area if it's going to work for you. But we have a great setup in Nova Scotia with the pharmacists where if you take the tick in, They'll identify what it is. I mean, it's a black-legged tick. It's not going to be hard to identify, but they'll confirm if it's a black-legged tick, and they'll do an assessment on you to determine whether or not you were at risk for contracting Lyme. Now, what the assessment is is basically where was it, how long was it on your body? That's number one, or number two, I should say, once it's identified. If it's been there less than 24 hours, then they'll say you're at low risk, then just watch for symptoms. I'll come back to symptoms in a minute time. If it's been greater than 24 hours, then they'll say, great, we are going to give you a loading dose of doxycycline. Doxycycline is a, a, a real vicious uh, antibiotic, but it is the one that is preferred use for working for people with potential Lyme disease. So what they do is they give you a double dose of doxycycline to take home and use immediately as long as the tick has been on you greater than 24 hours. And that's important. That's that's the other day they said, no, you don't qualify for the doxycycline. Um, okay. Now, the reason I'm being 
so in, intent on talking to you about pulling the ticks out safely is because if you rush and pull it out, as I mentioned, you could leave a portion of the tick behind. If you do so, it's going to eject whatever it has in its stomach into your skin and you increase the risk of infection dramatically. That head has to come out as well. It's a lot easier to do it slowly and patiently and get the whole tick out in one full piece. I really say that. Now, the one that was on me most recently, uh, no issues at all, no uh, rashes, no, no scars, no red spots after a couple of days. So there was the bite itself. The other one left a scar. It left a good sized scar from uh, how deep it was in. That, that's just the luck of the draw. I don't mind that at all, but uh, just to be aware of it. All right, now we're going to talk about Lyme disease because you may not find the tick in time. It may detach itself. And if it was carrying Lyme, that may now be in your system. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Still hot, but just closer to drinkable temperature. All right, moving on. Okay, let's say for whatever reason, you missed the tick. Maybe you found the tick after it withdrew from your skin. It was laying on your clothing or something. It's fully engorged, like a great big grape full of blood, your blood, by the way. And now you're worried about whether or not you've contracted Lyme disease. Well, you can still do t go take the tick to the drugstore and do the assessment. They likely will still give you the loading dose of doxycycline, but they'll also give you a list of warning signs to watch for to see if you are contracting Lyme disease. And we're not talking about blood tests yet. We'll get to that in a few moments time, because here, at least in Nova Scotia, you are treated symptomatically. You don't, if you know you were bitten by a tick and you're showing the signs and symptoms, they do not require proof that you have Lyme disease. They'll treat you as if you do. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So some of the symptoms, of course, are, and the one that people focus in on, and they really should not, is what's known as the bullseye rash. You'll see a series of two circles around the bite mark, and that's usually an indication that you have Lyme disease. However, the absence of those bullseye rings does not mean you don't have Lyme disease. You can have just a regular rash, kind of a, an irregular shape all around it. And that could also be an indication, or you may not have any rash at all. You may have no indication whatsoever that your tick was attached to your body, other than the fact that you found it there. So that's a misnomer about the rash. It might be there. If it's there, it's something to be concerned about. But if it's not there, it doesn't mean you don't have Lyme. I just want to point that out. So what are some of the symptoms of Lyme? Well, they usually don't start uh, appearing for upwards of three weeks after the bite and the transmission of the disease. Things like headache, uh, lethargic, so, you know, tired, weak, uh, uh, mind fog, aching in the joints. All these are signs and symptoms of Lyme disease. And the worrisome thing is, is they can come and go. The other worrisome thing is we can quite often attribute them to something else like overuse, like I was working too hard out here in the woods and now I'm achy all over, or, you know, I, I didn't get enough sleep, that's why I've got mind fog or a, or a headache. So all those things could be dismissed as being something else. And the further you get away from the original contact with the tick, the more likely you are to dismiss them, not even thinking about the fact that you might have contracted Lyme from a tick. And this is where things get a little bit harder and more difficult because now in order to treat them, because you have no history of being bitten by a tick, you have to have blood work done. And the blood work done is called an ELISA test. And here's my understanding of the ELISA test. They normally, the medical establishment, unless there's been some change, requires two positive testing for Lyme disease. So if you get one positive testing, they'll give you a second. If the second one comes back positive, they'll confirm that you have Lyme disease and they'll start treatment for it. We'll talk about treatment in a moment's time. But if the second one doesn't come back, what happens? So that's a little bit unclear to me. Maybe you get a third one. If you're still displaying the signs and symptoms, you need to advocate for yourself to see whether or not you truly have Lyme disease. And here's the other thing, the longer the Lyme disease is in your system, remember this is a virus, it's called a Spirouche virus, and under a microscope it looks like a little corkscrew. And what it does is it hides, it drills itself into your muscles and your nerves, and it stays there. 
and it can hide there for a long period of time and come back out at times of when you're at your lowest, such as if you had, um, you, you developed a, a, a disease or, or something like that, or you're very tired, or there's any number of reasons why. And the virus can come back out and become active again. When it's hidden, the ELISA test won't pick it up. See how things start to get a little bit challenging? So you're better off taking care of this early and being treated for Lyme early. So here's the thing, I've had, um, one of my very best friends, two years ago, died from complications of Lyme disease. It affected his heart. I mean, I watched this guy go downhill over a period of a couple of years, and uh, he had the brain fog, he had the lethargic, he, he had Lyme for a long period of time that had never been officially diagnosed. And when it finally was, they gave him the standard treatment for it, and it didn't work. See, that's why the longer it's in your system, the harder it is to get out. I have another friend now who also is now being treated for Lyme. Both of these men are younger than I am, by the way. He's being treated for chronic Lyme disease because of the, all the aches and pains. He was finally able to convince somebody to test him for Lyme, and uh, he uh, is diagnosed with Lyme, and he's undergoing long-term treatments. The treatment, by the way, the standard treatment is three weeks to a month worth of doxycycline. Uh, trust me, you don't want to do that if you don't have to. It will eat your inside out, and it's it just it play havoc with your health by itself. But, of course, it's better than having the Lyme, isn't it? So it's all relative. You just want to avoid having that happen. So now we're going to circle back to the beginning again. Not the risk stage so much as the prevention and mitigation. This is where I hope I have made the case for you to take seriously the risk of transmission of Lyme disease or any of the other tick-borne diseases and work to prevent them. Okay, I think that's all I need to say for this video. I think I've probably gone on long enough about ticks and Lyme disease. I will be putting the information I shared with you in the video description and some resources where you can do a little further digging, a little further reading about Lyme disease, the prevention, the treatment of it, as well as the other tick-borne diseases. But if you have any comments or questions, then put those in the comments section below. Until next time, get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.